You're listening to episode 36 of Paz de Chipotle. I'm your host, Rocío Carvajal, food history writer, cook, and author. And on this podcast, I explore the gastronomic traditions of Mexico and bring together the voices of cooks, authors, and entrepreneurs who build cross-cultural bridges around the world, championing Mexican food. To find more information about the podcast, please go to pasachipotle.com. You can subscribe and leave a review on iTunes, Player FM, Stitcher, Google Play, and YouTube. Hola, hola, and welcome back to Paz de Chipotle. And if this is the first time you tune in to the show, a very warm welcome. I've been very busy creating all sorts of great content to bring you in the following months. Combining food research, book writing, delivering food tours, cooking classes, and producing this show, it can be a bit challenging at times, but I think it's all those inputs that keep me on my toes and help me having a fresh view about the many ways in which food traditions touch our lives. And with that in mind, I have decided to create something new. For this third season of the podcast, I will take a closer view to the culinary regions of Mexico. Each of them is fascinating in their own right and are the result of specific circumstances that make them culturally significant and all of them have contributed to the elevation of Mexican cuisine as intangible heritage of mankind by UNESCO. As I unfold this metaphorical gastronomic map, it will become evident that the variety and abundance of ingredients and traditions across the different regions of Mexico are very hard to compress in a few sentences, let alone in a few dishes. That is why many interpretations of Mexican food fall really short to represent the whole of the nation's cuisine. Understanding the historical, social, and cultural aspects that inspired the gastronomic characteristics of Mexico is an epic and delicious adventure that is in constant evolution. As always, this episode will be available for you to enjoy on the most popular podcast apps, and a visual version of it can be found on Paz de Chipotle's channel on YouTube. For all the new listeners of the show, let me tell you there is so much more content that you can enjoy. And if you are an avid foodie reader, check out the section Books for Cooks on my website, pazitipotle.com, where you can find a curated list of my personal recommendations of books that will enhance your appreciation and enjoyment of food. And you can be the first to know all my latest news by subscribing for free to my newsletter. And so we begin 2019 and celebrate another year of the show with you. I hope you enjoy this episode. The culinary landscapes of Mexico mirror the vast and contrasting geographical zones of the country. In the 761,606 square miles, Mexico has astonishingly diverse landscapes that create many microclimates and ecosystems. No wonder why Mexico ranks fourth in the list of megadiverse countries. Our regional cuisines have developed upon several characteristics, the climate and soil, the agricultural systems created by indigenous cultures, the trade they developed, and the particular way in which Spanish colonization affected these elements. Mexican cuisine as we understand it today is in fact the result of an intense process of cultural exchange between the 68 native indigenous tribes that inhabited this territory and the Spanish food traditions, techniques, crops, and animals that were introduced into the Americas after the colonization. Put all of that in a pot and flavor it with the spices and aromas from the Middle East, India, Africa, and the Far East that came to the Americas thanks to the intense trade of the 16th and 17th century, known as the Colombian Exchange. The recipes, dishes, and agricultural practices that are the result of all that is what we acknowledge as Mexican food. 
The region with which I chose to open this serial is the majestic Central High Plains, framed by the volcanic belt and mountain ranges that create a system of vast and fertile valleys which have fed entire civilizations and continue to do so to this day. I am painfully aware that I have a strong bias for this region, as it is also my birthplace. I grew up walking these valleys, harvesting, cooking and eating its many traditional dishes. But the relevance of this region speaks for itself. It is the cradle of corn, the ancestral home of the greatest indigenous markets of the pre-Columbian world and the melting pot that created many of the most emblematic dishes of Mexico. The central high plains are not a perfectly delimited area, but they allocate the states of Puebla, Tlaxcala, Morelos, Mexico and Hidalgo. It has an average of 2,000 meters above sea level, uh, for those who refuse to use the decimal system, that is about mm, 6,561 feet. And the temperatures range from 8 to 34 Celsius degrees, which is considered actually quite mild, and has a generous rainy season that goes from April to September. This region was also the ancestral home of many indigenous tribes, such as the Tlaxcalteca, Popoloca, Nahua, Mazahua, Mazateca, Tepewa, Otomi, Olmeca, Xicalanca, and Cholulteca. And as I have mentioned before, the intense volcanic activity that occurred several thousands of years ago, well, except for Popocatépetl, created the perfect conditions for controlled humidity, sources of water and fertile soils that facilitated agriculture. But let me tell you exactly why specifically this area had such a concentration of cultures. And the reason is that almost 12,000 years ago, in the beginning of the agricultural revolution, during the Neolithic, uh, the very end of the Stone Age, all around the world, an extraordinary phenomena prompted the almost simultaneous transition from nomadic to sedentary lives and chose certain regions where the slow but incredibly transcendent domestication of grains took place. The domestication of corn occurred in an area which is located in the limits of the modern states of Puebla and Oaxaca, where certain ancient wild grasses were first discovered. And they were mis-qualid plants with really few and irregular kernels that grew from what it looked like an oversized wheat spike. But the human groups that came across this grain saw great potential in it, and after several thousand years of continuous selection and cultivation, the plant evolved until achieving the characteristics, size, shape and flavor we know today. Mexico has 11 varieties and over 220 cultivars of corn, and the tribes that settled and shared large areas of the central high plains were the ones responsible for the creation of many corn-based dishes and studies suggest that we owe to the tribes in this area the perfecting of one of the most important foods of Mexico, the Tlaxcali, but you might know it by its Spanish name of tortilla. The cultivation of corn combined with beans, chiles, tomatoes and courgettes creates a microsystem that generates a symbiosis between the plants. That means that while the corn's hungry roots soak up the nutrients of the soil, the canes also provide shade and structure for the beans to grow and return nitrogen back into the earth, while tomatoes, chiles and courgettes fertilize and balance the acidity of the soil. This crop system is known as milpa and has been used continuously for more than 9,000 years in Mexico. We will return with the show 
after this short break. Bonjour, je m'appelle Amélie, je viens de France et j'adore écouter Pasa Chipotle Podcast. Hola, soy Ramiro, soy de Matamoros, México y me encanta escuchar el podcast Pasta Chipotle. Chipotle Podcast. Namaste, me la nam Kim. India se and me pass the Chipotle podcast sunne ko acha lagta hai. Hello everyone, this is Kira from the United States and I love listening to the Pass the Chipotle podcast. Hello, this is Rebecca from the UK and I love listening to Pass the Chipotle podcast. Sabor, this is Mexican food is a digital editorial project that celebrates the wonderful world of Mexican gastronomy, the flavors, ingredients, and traditions that have shaped this world-acclaimed cuisine. And now you can purchase and download a bundle containing all four available issues, the origins, go-go, street food, and Mexican fiestas. Enjoy 23 thought-provoking articles and stunning photography that opens a window to understand and appreciate Mexico's rich culinary traditions. And unveil the secrets to prepare 43 delicious recipes that bring families together and will help you enjoy the making of your own traditions. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash magazine and get your bundle of sabor. Enjoy it in all your digital devices. Go to pasachipotle.com forward slash magazine and get ready to cook, learn and enjoy Mexican food like you've never imagined. It is not a surprise then that in this fertile and prosperous region, many large indigenous cities like Cholula, Tula and Teotihuacan flourished. And it was also chosen by the Mexica to build the capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, which was destroyed by Hernán Cortés to build the capital of New Spain and later received the name of Mexico City. A direct consequence of this was that the newly built European-like cities around it had the largest concentrations of Spanish immigrants that shared their rapidly crowded settlements with a native indigenous population. While the colonial regime established a racially divided social structure in which white Europeans enjoyed many privileges and mixed race, indigenous and slaves of African or Asian origins were subjects of the Spaniards. And just like in any colonial society, relations had many degrees of political and cultural tension. But the inevitable exchange of agricultural and food knowledge was essential to the survival of all. During the 16th, 17th and even 18th centuries, Many European crops from colder regions were successfully introduced, which is why today we find grains such as wheat, barley and oats, along with fruits such as pears, apples, plums, cherries and peaches, and vegetables like carrots, beetroot, onion and garlic, all of which were slowly introduced into the central region of Mexico. The colonial pantries of the High Plains were by far the most lavishly stocked as trade routes ensured a regular supply of native and imported foods and ingredients. And it was at the domestic and religious kitchens of affluent cities like Puebla that became the ultimate gastronomic laboratories. The most important merchant ports in New Spain in the colonial period were Veracruz in the Gulf of Mexico, which received all ships from Europe and Africa, and Acapulco in the Pacific coast was the entry point of the grand merchant ships from China that always picked up products from South Asia, India and the Philippines. And that is how many spices and foods that we consider today as quintessentially Mexican made their way into this part of the world. And it might surprise you to know that among these precious items are cinnamon, 
cumin, cloves, coffee, sugar, coriander, pineapples, tamarind, hibiscus, mangoes, bananas, rice, and limes. There's low but essential exchange of cooking methods, combining flavors and creating new dishes, reflected not only the abundance of these ingredients, it also shaped a new cultural identity of a rich and complex mixed heritage. And let me illustrate this with four dishes that represent much of this exchange. Mole poblano, the ubiquitous mulis, which were indigenous stews prepared with toasted and ground seeds of chiles, pumpkin and other seeds, were dissolved in thick broths made with tomatoes, more chiles and seasoned with herbs. The protein was usually in the form of fish or wild game that was regularly hunted, not farmed, like deer, armadillo, certain birds and also edible insects combined with vegetables. Come in the European and Asian galleons with lavishly aromatic spices and exotic fruits. And the once basic muli recipes from the Poblano region were transformed by the creativity of Spanish and indigenous cooks who added onions, garlic, cloves, raisins, cinnamon, anisid, plantain, pig's lard, sesame seeds, and chocolate, among many other ingredients, that gave as a result an intensely rich and multi-layered dish, so emblematic that it is seen as a national treasure. Barbacoa from Hidalgo Barbecuing is a cooking method present in almost every civilization around the world. In Mexico, the indigenous techniques of slow steaming meat in a hole using the residual heat of charcoal and hot stones was widely used in the central high plains, where giant agave plants grow. The leaves of these plants are used as insulation and recipient to cook vegetables, fish and game. After the introduction of farming animals from Europe, such as pigs, cattle, sheep, goats, horses and donkeys, they found their way rapidly into the colonial diet. Marinades had the addition of foreign ingredients like bay leaves, cumin, garlic, oranges, onion and apple vinegar that created a more complex and flavorful combination that infused mutton and sheep during the cooking process. Pozole from Morelos. In a previous episode of the show, which you can find on YouTube, I talk extensively about the history of pozole soup, and I really recommend you to listen to it if you want to know more. The giant corn kernels of the Cacahua Simple corn variety are the base to make this ancient dish that was formerly flavored with different herbs like oregano, epazote, and chiles. When cooked, the Cacahua Simple kernels open and bloom, resembling oversized popcorn that have a very pleasant texture and bite. In the colonial period, the soup gained many flavors that were added to the broth like garlic, pepper and bay leaves, enriched with pork and chicken. With that, it became a hearty dish to which all the foreign ingredients were added as garnishings, like chopped onion, lettuce, radishes and lime juice. Tortillas from Tlaxcala. The Tlaxcalteca tribe made a name for themselves as fierce and powerful warriors, eternal rivals of the Aztec army. But they had another equally important asset. They possessed a fertile territory where they mainly grew amaranth and corn, which was not only the main commodity for their trade, but local corn-based foods were also famous for their refinement, variety and flavor. And they coined the most popular name of the most popular food of the indigenous gastronomy. As I said earlier, we only came to know it by the foreign name that was given to it by Spanish conquistadors. But tortillas back then were known as Tlaxcali and have been ever since the most efficient, nutritious, versatile and long-lasting tradition that still reigns over every Mexican table. Yellow, white and blue tortillas hot and freshly made, simply sprinkled with salt, 
or a dollop of salsa are one of the most lavish and simple of culinary pressures one can ever experience. As you can see, the impact of the pre-existing culinary traditions of the Central High Plains grew exponentially with the addition of Spanish and European techniques, recipes and tastes that gave us a result dishes that incorporate the indigenous preference for a plant-rich cuisine that use methods like charring or naked flames, grinding and steaming, with the Spaniards' strong like of heavily spiced food loaded with meats and sweet and savory combinations. On a final note, I want to mention that when Spaniards conquered Mexico in 1521, they had only gained themselves their independence in 1492, after almost 700 years of Muslim domination. What this means is that their own gastronomic traditions and the whole of their cultural identity had been deeply transformed by the presence of powerful caliphates who were responsible for introducing into Europe a vast and delicious legacy of flavors and ingredients that will continue to live on and help in the shaping of another great cuisine in a continent far, far away that will become one of the most celebrated gastronomies of the world. And with this, we finish the first special of the culinary regions of Mexico. Next, I will talk about the exuberant peninsula of Yucatan, the grand legacy of the mysteriously vanished Mayan culture and the flavors and history of the Mexican Caribbean. Thank you for listening. This episode was written and produced by me, Rocío Carvajal. To find more information about this show, please go to pasdechipotle.com. Find the link on this episode's description. Many of you have asked, what can you do to support the show? And the best way to do this is by recommending it to a friend and leaving a review with many stars on any or all of your favorite podcast apps. The next episode of the show is an interview with Jolene Benjamin, a Dutch food anthropologist, entrepreneur and consultant whom I met in London and is currently living in Toronto, Canada. Yep, those are the paths of a gastronomad with whom I will talk about food studies, culinary incubators and food as a universal language across time and cultures. Well, that's it for today, my friends. Until the next time.